Greetings. Uh, my name's Jim Tudor. I'm with ZekeFilm.org, and with us today is Matt Perry, filmmaker, film historian, and uh, uh, the maker of a film called Sin Evangelist. Sin Evangelist is a 25-minute long interview short film uh, covering uh, the revival house scene in Baltimore primarily and, well, exclusively through the lens of Mr. George Figs, who owned and operated a uh, revival house of his own, uh, among other things, his adventures in uh, uh, life in uh, cinema exhibition. And Matt has made the film Sin Evangelist about George. And uh, here to discuss it is Matt. And Matt, thank you for coming on to our, uh, our show here, as it were. <laughs> For having me on i'm glad to be able to talk about this film with you yeah uh, so tell me when did you make this film uh when did i Is yeah it yeah oh, when, it, when... Was, it started back in uh it was the summer of 2017 so i think it was july of 2017 mm -hmm. and i uh, i can give you a little backstory on on how it came about uh, i had moved back to uh baltimore where i you know i, I grew up in the area and then had lived in New York for several years and uh, moved back to Baltimore in 2016. And one of the, uh, you know, one of the great things here is our, uh, the Charles theater, the, the great revival series. And so I started going right back to that as soon as I, uh, as soon as I was back in town. And that's where I reconnected with George, uh, with George Figs. Uh, he, he's a regular at those, at those revival screenings. Um, and I had uh, I had been in touch with George years uh, years and years ago, back when I was uh, really just starting to get seriously interested in film when I was in in middle school, and uh, that's when I first met George at the Orpheum Cinema. I, I can get into that story separately if you like, but to, to, yeah. to answer your question about the uh, about Sin Evangelist here, uh, how how this came to be, uh, when I reconnected with George, I wanted to get his story down on 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 camera uh to be able to share you know help, kind of help get get the word out uh, about the films that he's passionate about uh, he's really dedicated his life to cinema to bringing uh, revival film to audiences to helping new generations discover all of these great films and uh and the way i saw it is i just wanted to sort of help get george's story out there and help kind of uh, celebrate somebody who's uh, done so much to inspire my own uh, passion for film over the years. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, George's story uh, on in your film. He recaps a lot of his own life. Uh, could you uh, give us just a taste of what it is about him and his story uh, that motivated you uh, specifically to think I, I need to get this on film? Well, like I said, George is you know, very passionate about film, and he's the kind of person who uh, he he loves to share that that passion. I, I think it's I think it's uh, safe to say he's the kind of person who, uh, when you speak with him about film or hear him talk about film, it's hard not to pick up on on some of that that passion and excitement that he has. And when I was a like I said a very you know young uh, kind of budding film enthusiast um, when I was. Uh, 13, I had the opportunity to interview him at the Orpheum Cinema as part of a class uh, project that I was doing for school on Maryland theaters. And it was really a, uh, an amazing experience to be able to talk to George because he was the first person that I ever connected with who shared my interest in movies. You know, before that, I, I guess as a, as a kid, you know, you, you sort of feel like you're maybe the only one of your friends who has who has this interest in movies who who is interested in movies beyond just you know whatever's playing at the at the movies each week so it it was kind of a uh, it was easy to feel a little a little isolated sometimes with with that interest but when i met george um you know he was the first person i had that experience of talking uh with about films who shared that interest and i learned so much from him in our in our talk and that interview that I did with him, which is actually, I, I do have it on um, YouTube, was done in 1997, like I said, as part of this class project. 
And I remember going down to, you know, I'd written a letter or whatever to, to, to him at the theater and he agreed to speak with me. And uh, I remember going down there and it was just like, the most exciting thing in the world for me at that age to be able to sit down with somebody who not only uh, shared that interest in movies, but he was at that time working in, in the business. He was not only just running the theater, but he was working as a dailies projectionist for films that were being shot in Baltimore at that time. And so he just had this incredible breadth of knowledge and experience and you know, passion for film. And, you know, when you were, like I say, when you're at that age, just getting interested in all of this, that's, uh, it's an incredible thing to um, find that kind of inspiration. Uh, so, so George really provided that for me. And uh, like I said, this film for me was partly a way of kind of really to say thank you for uh, all this, you know, that support that he uh, gave me at that, at that you know, stage of my own life and my own interest in film. Wow. So that's fantastic. Yeah, the film really is uh, an honor um, to him. It, it, it's, it, it is just him speaking uh, for the film. Uh, we don't really hear from you. Uh, but it works. It works really well uh, that, you know, it's, it's a it's a humble approach, if you don't mind me saying that uh, you, you uh, basically have your camera there. Uh, I mean, you open it up by following him into his projection room to kind of establish where we are here um, and this and where you shoot this. This is his his uh, former yeah. revival house theater, right? No, the film is actually shot in his in his in his home in his house. And oh, it's his house. Yes, and all of that um, memorabilia that you see. The, 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 there's the uh, the box office. Um, yeah, that that there the posters and everything that actually came from, as I understand it, most of that came from the yeah. lobby of the Orpheum Cinema. Wow. And if I can just say a quick word about that, uh, the lobby yeah. of the Orpheum, I, I should I should say that going to, going there for the first time. Uh, it was, it really was like going into another world because it was done up, as he says in the film, you know, it was sort of done up as a kind of tribute to the neighborhood theaters that, that he had grown up going to, but he had in the lobby, uh, it was, you know, wall to wall lobby cards, posters, uh, all sorts of memorabilia. And, uh, he had a small little, uh, section in there with uh, film books, like a little film library where, you know, people could sit and, because uh, it, it was always a double feature. So between shows, you could sit and check out the books, discuss the films with other fans there. So he really created a space, I think, that it, it wasn't just a place to see a movie, but it was really a space for community. And uh, again, you know, in those days before you could connect with people online or any, any of that, you know, this was, uh, it, like I said, it was almost like going into a different world for me. When was this theater operational? That sounds fantastic. Uh, yeah, it was for about a decade from 1990 to 1999. Uh, and I started going there in 1995 when I was uh, 11 years old. Um, I can share with you real quick how, uh, how, I, how I came to um, find this theater. Yeah. Now, I, I was growing up outside of about an hour outside of Baltimore. So it wasn't really you know, on my immediate radar or anything like that. It wasn't something that I would have seen you know, just around town or anything like that. But I was, uh, I, I still remember this day. It was in the summer of 95. I was riding with my dad in his car. We were listening to uh, the local NPR station and they were giving away tickets to a double, an Alfred Hitchcock double feature of, uh, of Notorious and Lifeboat at this little, this theater called the Orpheum Cinema, which I'd never heard of. But I thought, uh, it just kind of blew my mind that there was actually a theater that was showing Alfred Hitchcock movies. I, I you know, at this time, a TCM was just kind of getting started. Before that, you know, anything I really wanted to see was on video. So the idea of actually being able to go to a theater and to see films, uh, you know, like Alfred Hitchcock's films or any older movie, anything that wasn't, you know, first run Hollywood movie, uh, that idea just blew my mind. So I immediately uh, asked my dad, I said, look, uh, forget about, you know, I don't even, not even worried about winning the tickets. I said, but we just got to go check this place out. And I was very, you know, very fortunate. My, I have to say my dad is always very supportive of, of, you know, my interest in film or whatever I was interested in. And so he, um, you know, without 
any, uh, you know, without any, any hesitation, uh, he agreed to take me down to the theater to see the movies. And he, I remember we we're driving down and he said, you know, uh, just so you know, he said, this, this might be, this theater might be nothing more than, you know, like somebody's, uh, like, you know, like a loft apartment, you know, screening in a, a screen in a projector in a loft apartment or something. I said, well, it's, you know, fine with me. I'm, I'm ready to check it out. And I remember we, you know, got down there and it was, uh, it was, it was, it was a, uh, you know, it was certainly bigger than what, maybe what we had imagined, but it was still very much a small, uh, very, very kind of intimate space, uh, you know, one, one screen, of course. And the way the theater was set up uh, was really unique. I'll just mention this really quickly. There was a, uh, it uses a back, it used a back projection system because of space. Um, they actually had the projector behind the screen and then the image was, was you know, flipped at the, la at the last stage. Um, and I was able to actually go back and see the uh, system at that time because you know I was really I was really fascinated by how it all worked, and um, and so the theater. The other thing I should mention is that this theater was located in the Fells Point neighborhood of Baltimore, which, especially at that time, it was very you know arts focused. Uh, you know there was there was a, a great art scene there. Uh, it was it was a really a different world than what I knew growing up, you know, growing up where I did. And so it really kind of, like I say, it really did open my eyes to a lot of, a lot of new things. And uh, uh, so, so anyway, that was how I, that's how I first came to go, you know, go to the Orpheum. And uh, then uh, a couple years later, I started going regularly. I would say almost every weekend, my dad would take me down there. Uh, we saw the film that kind of kicked off our, our, our regular trips down there was Detour and Clash by Night double feature. So we were, really got into seeing the film noir movies, which George loved, and he, he always programmed great film noir double features. Uh, so that really kind of kicked off there for a couple of years going, you know, at least at least a couple times a month to see whatever George was showing. Great. Um, that's that's wonderful. I, one of my questions was, what types of films do you remember seeing? That certainly uh, <laughs> takes care of that. Uh, George, in the movie, uh, you begin with him telling this story of showing, as many revival theaters did, uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and how that would... Uh, sometimes the the shenanigans that came with a Rocky Horror show, um, you know, caused damage to theaters. Right. And and he talks about having to, you know, string up a new screen because a screen was damaged. And then he goes on later, and this was very poignant, when he, he talks about how this thought that he had that screens might recall and remember and absorb, uh, you know, the, the spirit, the essence of all the movies that have been screened on them. I know I'm getting the words a little bit wrong there, but that was, as I recall, the gist of what he was, was saying. And I thought, what a, what a fantastic, beautiful little thought there. Um, beautiful, beautiful how does, it. so, and that, that, kind of illuminates to a point this notion of sin evangelist right. um this uh almost almost religious uh connection to the movies and this was something obviously very important to him um uh, i suppose still is i don't know is is george still out and about and doing this today uh, yeah i mean he's still very active here in the in the uh, revival film scene you know i just saw him uh couple weeks ago at the Charles revival series. So yeah. He's, yeah. He's... Yeah. So uh, yeah, this, uh, maybe this would be a better question for him then, but um, you know, per what you uh, derived from him in your chats, uh, can you talk a little bit about this idea uh, of, of films as something, as something greater in life for people? Yeah, and that, that, I should mention that title, Sin Evangelist, The Life and Revival Film, that comes from his, uh, you know, he, he calls himself the Sin Evangelist. Um, okay. And, you know, he sees it as, as he says in the film, you know, it's, uh, for him, it really is kind of like a, a, a mission, I guess, to bring these films to a new generation. Um, 
and yeah, he talks about that idea of film almost as a kind of spiritual experience. Uh, I'll say for me, that's, that is something that I share. Uh, you know, I think when films are incredibly important to our life, I, I think like this is probably true of any art, you know, anything that people find a lot, uh, deep meaning in that, uh, it maybe transcends, you know, just the, the, uh, purpose that it was originally, uh, whatever it may have originally been created for or originally served. You know, I think a lot of films that uh, may have been made, you know, strictly commercial interests, uh, you know, sometimes they can really find ways of connecting with audiences uh, beyond, you know, anything that even the filmmakers may have envisioned. Uh, you know, like his story about the Rocky Horror Picture Show, I think is a good example of that, that, you know, this is a, a good example of a movie that really took on a life of its own, uh, you know, it's meant a lot to a lot of people, you know, there's really been this whole community that's uh, come up around it. And, you know, it's developed, obviously, this, this, you know, cult following over the decades. And there's a lot of films, I think, that, uh, that do that. And it's, it, it does speak to something special about the way that movies can take on a really personal meaning for all of us. And it might be, you know, different from person to person. I think for George, uh, you know, as he describes in the film, a big part of that was, you know, just experiencing these movies on the big screen, and that's something that you know he and I both have talked about uh, just in our in our personal conversations is the power of seeing films on a big screen. Like one of the things I say in the description of this movie is, you know, that he's bringing, helping to bring. Um, helping audiences to see the films the way they were meant to be seen and and by that you know i mean really on the on the big screen where it's a kind of a communal experience uh shared experience as i call i, I always call it you know dreaming together as the, the audience coming together and experiencing the film uh collectively so i, I think there is a lot of uh a lot of power there and i, I would say it's it's you know as you can see in the film you know that that holds true for i think for george's um views towards film as well yeah absolutely so that yeah it's this this notion that, that just speaks to the power of film however however one may feel about it um i i didn't get the impression that he was actually you know worshiping kneeling before the screen or anything but uh you know the notion of sin evangelist i think is something that uh you know, a lot of those of us who uh, are enthusiastic about movies and really want to um, share and communicate what it is that special uh, can relate to, you know, e even those of us who maybe haven't thrown our lives behind it, uh, <laughs> um, as some of us have. Anyway, George, uh, one thing I wanted to ask about is this other uh, niche that uh, I, I I happened upon, you know, reading about George, um, that he had actually worked with the director John Waters, and in in certain films. And your your film doesn't really cover this. You don't get into that. Uh, although I was wondering if you uh, knew anything more about how uh, you know George Figgs wound up in john waters movies yeah i mean i think that that, that uh aspect of his work has been you know covered elsewhere and i wanted to focus on his um you know work running the theater i i can say that we've you know we've recorded a few interviews um that are on youtube uh just on different topics and one of them he talks about screen setting up the screenings of some of uh, john waters earliest short films uh back in the early 60s uh so he you know, kind of, kind of was part of those same circles. That's how he came to be involved with the films. Uh, you know, he's, he was in um, probably most famously he played uh, Jesus in Multiple Maniacs. And he was also in, um, you know, Pink Flamingos, Female Trouble, Desperate Living. And, uh, you know, has kind of worked. I mean, when I, when I met George, he was uh, at that time, as I say, he was working as a dailies projectionist. And I remember he was running at that time the dailies for the John Waters film uh, Pecker that was being shot in Baltimore at that point. This was, a, was in the late '97. So uh, yeah, I mean he he is uh, you know part of that kind of that original uh, group of friends and actors uh, that worked with John Waters on his early films, and 
Uh, and there's, you know, there's some good interviews out there with him about his uh, involvement in that scene. You as a filmmaker uh, and the decisions you made in covering George's story. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about that. Uh, as I mentioned, the movie is very, uh, you know, you, you keep the frame very wide and put him in the middle of it in his, as it turns out, his home. Um, forgive me for thinking that was his theater. Um, you know, we see equipment and the box office and all this stuff around, you know, it's like, oh, we're in a movie theater. Got it um, all in there. So yeah. 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 So, you know, of course his home would be like a movie theater. This all makes sense, but you keep the frame very wide. And while he's speaking, you know, uh, I, 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 I couldn't help but just scan around the frame and be kind of, you know, uh, you know, fixate momentarily on a little piece of memorabilia or something that he had there while, while he was speaking. Uh, and and uh, I just wanted to ask, um, is this a style that uh, you claim as your own, or is this something that you applied to this one project? And, uh, and what led you to this decision, this um, stylistic decision? Yeah, to me, uh it comes down to this, that George is an excellent storyteller. And, you know, I really mean that in every sense. I mean, he, he's, uh, he's a very engaging speaker. He has fascinating stories to share. And my, uh, my, my plan all along was just to really bring uh, every viewer, you know, kind of right there into his, into his living room, just to be able to sit down, just like, you know, like I did filming it just to sit down and be able to listen to, what he has, what he has to say, and and not to distract in any way from, uh, you know, from his his stories or his his ideas, um, you know, to me that approach was all that was needed, uh, just to, to really get this get this uh, down on on camera, and that's something you know with other films that I make, I, I guess I am drawn to just you know do, doing whatever I need to do just to just to get the ideas down on camera. I'm not especially interested in opening it up for its own sake, you know, moving the camera for its own sake or anything that might distract, you know, for me, it's, uh, especially in this case, though, I just wanted to bring people um, kind of into a, a front row seat, you know, into, into his, uh, into his Orpheum Museum, as, as he calls it, uh, his the living room there of his house, and, and just to be able to sit down and hear some of the kinds of um, ideas that have really inspired me. Uh, and I do want to, I'll just add real quick, you mentioned all of the, uh, the, the incredible uh, memorabilia that he has in that room. And it, it truly is like overwhelming to sit there and just take it all in. I mean, even especially in, in person, because there's so many lobby, you know, lobby cards you see and great um, collectible posters and still photographs. And like I said, I remember a lot of those from the lobby of the Orpheum. So he really has kind of managed to recreate a lot of that magic right there in the, the, the front room of his house. Did you do any set dressing, like, you know, move certain things into the frame that you thought might uh, compliment him or that you wanted there? Or did you just literally sit down and this was it? He just sat down and that was it. I mean, he yeah. has the way you see it in the, in the movie is pretty much you know, how, how it's normally arranged, you know, and, and, uh, I think it's it's a it's a good backdrop uh, certainly for this, and I think it captures some of that. Like I, you know, say like some of the magic that I used to feel walking into the uh, lobby of the Orpheum. Um, it, it, it's also, in a way, uh, you, you feel like you've got sort of this whole, you know, film history before your eyes because you know George's interest in films is very wide-reaching, and so if you look among these posters, you'll see everything from. Uh, uh, still photos of character actors from Hollywood's golden age up to, you know, an amazing piece that he has. It's kind of a um, collage of poster images of, of cult movies, which I, I think he said came from the, uh, I believe it was the Coolidge Corner Theater in, uh, I believe that's in Cambridge, uh, back from the maybe the early 80s. So it, this is like this, this uh, it's like a kind of a patchwork poster of, uh, of, of some of the great cult films that would have uh, screened there over the years. So he's, he's got really the whole of film history represented on the walls of his, of his front room there. So before we 
wrap up, uh, I'd just like to ask you about any particular fond memories you have of uh, uh, of his theater. Uh, if you visited, uh, uh, saw particular movies there, um, any but, stories? Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the one of the most uh, amazing shows that he ever put together, uh, and this would have been in the fall of uh, 1995. He did a double feature of a local. Uh, well, it was it was Buster Keaton's The Cameraman, uh, and, and a local locally made feature called uh, Flickers, a silent romantic comedy by Robbie Chaffetz. I highly recommend this movie. Um, it's a, it was shot in, uh, I believe it was Frederick, Maryland. He used the uh, Weinberg Theater there. Uh, so it, that was kind of, you know, kind of a connection to another um, nice theater here in Maryland. Anyway, this was a, an homage to silent comedy. And he showed this on a double feature with the cameraman and actually brought in a live vaudeville show uh, to do before the film. So he, I remember he had, you know, jugglers, uh, you know, guy playing a saw, you know, that sort of thing, kind of the kind of uh, novelty acts that you would have seen in a in a vaudeville show in the 20s and programmed this whole night. It was, a, you know, a night of uh, two silent comedies, basically one, you know, one classic and one new and uh, and, and these really fun live, you know, vaudeville performances. And I'll just say one one thing that was so special about that for me was I, I, you know, I love silent comedy. That's really what got me interested in film beyond, you know, again, kind of beyond just the first Ron Hollywood films that we all see uh, growing up. So it was great, great to see, you know, Keaton film on the big screen, but also tying into this, seeing this independently made film, because at that time I was just, you know, just starting to make films of my own with the family camcorder, that sort of thing, like a lot of kids do, I guess. And to see a locally made independent film and that was actually, you know, again, being screened at a theater on, and that that was really inspiring to me as well. So that's that's the thing is that George, um, not, o not only did he really nurture that appreciation for the classics and for, for older films, but he also gave a lot of opportunities to new and you know uh, emerging filmmakers to show their work uh there were a few other shorts that i saw at the orpheum over the years that um, you know i would not have seen anywhere else and you know so that that was also very inspiring to me as a as a young filmmaker and like i said when i did my first interview with george back in 97 you know he was very generous with his time he sat with me for nearly an hour there in the, in the lobby of the orpheum that you can see this on youtube i have it up there uh, you know, just, you know, kind of indulging all of the young film buffs, many questions about, about the cinema. So I, I have a lot of, uh, you know, there, I mentioned the uh, double feature of Detour and Clash by Night that my dad and I saw there, which was rather accidental because uh, at that time, you know, he advertised in the paper and in the local, in the Baltimore Sun, and he would actually switch the programs out midweek at that point. I think it was like Sunday through Tuesday and then Wednesday through Saturday or something. So I had uh, Tuesday's paper and it was, a, it, they were advertising a double feature of Harvey and out of the past. I, I don't know how I remember this, but it, so that's what we thought we were going to see. We got down there, but it was Wednesday. So the program had changed. I didn't, I didn't realize that we got down there and they were showing this movie detour mm -hmm. and I had never heard of this. I had no idea what detour was. So my dad and I checked it out and, I remember reading the description because George always had a uh, like a, a little program or a flyer for each uh, film uh, that you could take. And looking at the description, you know, talking about this movie made in you know six days or whatever with a twenty thousand dollar budget really intrigued me. I could, again, it was this this fascination with what, what what you know what does this look like? So we went in there kind of blind, not knowing what to expect, and it's become a favorite film of both mine and my dad. So that was a, that was a really great experience. Um, you know, some of the other, I remember right after uh, Frank Sinatra passed away in 1998, he did a double feature of Manchurian Candidate and Anger is Away, you know, two very different movies, but they showed kind of the two different sides of Sinatra's talent. And that was the first time I'd been able to see the Manchurian Candidate, another one of my favorite films. Um, and 
yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I could go on and on, but these were just some of the many, many great double features he programmed. That's great. Yeah. I, I recall the 1990s and I was in film school then. So, you know, I was, uh, you know, budding as a film buff in my own right. Uh, you know, I went in wanting to be a filmmaker and came out a film buff. And, um, you know, in that time, there was this kind of what I perceived, at least, as a revival house chic kind of, you know, came about with, uh, you know, guys like Quentin Tarantino that was just supernova popular then. And, um, you know, would, you know, was he was just considered so cool that any platform that he was given, he used to talk about these old movies. And for just that moment in time in the 90s, it seemed like a lot of people that might not otherwise have been interested in something like, you know, detour or whatever he was yakking about. And we know he yaks a lot, but, uh, you know, whatever he was yakking about uh, had a moment in the sun, it seemed, you know, was given this validity. It's like, oh, you know, um, you know, Quentin Tarantino or somebody like him who was coming in his wake or was there a little bit earlier, like Soderbergh or somebody, uh, you know, set the stage. And you say that uh, the Orpheum was in business throughout the nineties. Uh, you know, I can't help but think that, uh, you know, there was this, this revival moment then and going forward, you know, what, I, I'm just wondering, what do we do? You know, we've got films like yours that, uh, you know, talk about this. Um, what's a film buff to do when maybe we don't have the revival houses and things uh, out there? Uh, you know, how do you feed your filmic soul, per se? Well, yeah, it's, it's a good question because there's, uh, on the one hand, I think there's more out there to see than ever before i mean i'm i'm continually amazed how much i can find streaming you know that i never thought i would see but um then it gets into the question of curation i think a little bit and like yeah. you're saying with somebody like a tarantino or um you know for me martin scorsese was kind of another voice at that yeah. in the 90s at that time in my life who i sort of would turn to and, and critics like roger ebert you know with the, with the great movies column I would get um, ideas about you know what 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 was worth checking out because when you're when you, especially when you really don't have any context for it and you're just sort of beginning this journey into exploring film, it is overwhelming. I think yeah. it, it, there's so much out there, and you you read um, you know there's books that will talk about you know great films. Um, you know, for me, there were books from the public library that I would. Kind of pour over that would list uh you know the, the great films landmark films uh, and those were good guides for me because you would see the same films turning up in all these different books and then you'd see lists like the sight and sound poll or the afi was another big thing in the 90s um not not to go off on a tangent but just to tie in with something you said you know i think there was a sense in the 90s of really looking looking back at film history uh, there was that, you know, the 100th anniversary of film, basically, in the, in the mid 90s was, a, I think that had a really big impact on the way I thought about film, because there was a, although there was a lot of exciting things happening with independent film, Kevin Smith, Tarantino, Rodriguez, Soderbergh, I was a little young for that at that, at that point, I was aware of it, but I was a little, you know, young to be seeing the film. So for me, a lot of it took the form of exploring these uh, lists of great films that, you know, the AFI was putting out or, or what, you know, what have you. And so what I'm getting at is I think those voices uh, are still very important because even though there's more out there than ever before, and it's a great time just to explore, uh, I imagine for anybody, you know, somebody, the proverbial 12, 13 year old today, uh, it's, even more overwhelming just because there's oh. there is so much to parse through and um so as far and you know and then with you know maybe revival houses not being as prevalent as they were thir you know 20 30 years ago whatever um you know it does 
I, I think what I'm what I what I miss about it now, I, I as I said, we're still very fortunate here in Baltimore. We have the Charles Theater where this mm. does exist. So I don't mean to suggest it's it's gone, but yeah. I do think that um, the community aspect is something that yeah. I miss, and I miss that about you know going to the Orpheum. And although it exists, I mean, a lot of people would argue this exists online now through social media sites and like some of the conversations happening on Twitter or Letterboxd or whatever. But for me, it's not really the same thing. I, I, I think what was, as I said earlier, what was so special for me in meeting George was to meet somebody who um, shared my interests in film, who, uh, and, and you know, again, when you're that age, kind of feeling like you're not alone in in, in that interest. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think that's one of the greatest things that the, uh, the community aspect of revival cinema or any theatrical experience really can provide. Uh, but I think there'll be, I think, you know, young budding film enthusiasts in 2021 and beyond, you know, I think they'll continue to find their own ways of forming those communities. But I, I, I do hope that they find that because that, that to me is one of the most rewarding yeah. aspects of, of all of this. Yeah, with the, uh, you know, we're coming out of this uh, uh, time of quarantine and pandemic and whatnot. And of course, a lot of the movie theaters uh, have been closed and, uh, you know, hard to use. But what we have had was this kind of weird drive-in revival that's happened. Uh, I've noticed that locally I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, and, and we've had, you know, you know, the drive-ins had become maybe, a, a an only option for a certain time. Uh, of course, then what you see in the terms of programming, it's, uh, and maybe this has to do with the stressful times we were living in, but they resort to, you know, what I think of as cinematic comfort food, the same, you know, 150 or 250 movies. Uh, that anyone's ever heard of, like uh, here's Ghostbusters and the Princess Bride at the drive in, you know, and and on one hand, that's great uh, to provide people with that with that comfort, that kind of cinema nourishment that they love. Um, but on the other hand, this this, uh, you know, cinemaphile part of me is like, yeah, but, you know, what about detour? Like you say, you know, what about uh, the whole other hundred and 10 years or whatever we've got now uh, of, uh, of cinema history that you can dive into film is a one thing I've learned. It's like, and I'm, I'm 47 years old and have been a movie buff for pretty much as long as I can remember that cinema is a, it's just an endless well with endless tangents to discover. And, you know, we're never done. You know, we're never done exploring and we need these people like George uh, to to curate uh, and to lay a path for us. And I just want to thank you for introducing uh, us to George in, in the way that you have the sin evangelist. Um, it's uh, it's it's a wonderful little little movie and, uh, you know, really, you know, kind of gets you thinking uh, about a lot of these things we've talked about. Really glad you enjoyed it, and uh, you know, appreciate uh, your kind words about it. I, like I said, it was a uh, you know, very special film for me to make. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I hope that you know, what I what I, I hope is that it gets you know George's um, message out there to people that it introduces more people to somebody who's had a big impact on me and the way I you know engage with film and and really helps to kind of spark my own passion for film um, when I was younger and. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, to me, it's really just about keeping, helping to keep the magic alive for, you know, the generations to follow. Yeah. So how can people see this? I know I got to see it as a bonus feature on the, uh, the uh, Kino Lorber Blu-ray release of uh, The Projectionist by Abel Ferrara. They've included your film as a bonus feature, which is, I think, pretty exciting. And congratulations on that. Uh, so is there, the I'm sorry. I, I'm glad that it was able to be included on there for sure. Yeah. That, was, that was a very nice way to get it out there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a bonus feature on the, the Blu-ray and DVD of the projectionist, uh, but it's also available to 
uh, buy or rent digitally on Kino Now, which is the uh, Kino Lorber uh, digital platform. Terrific. Okay. Well, is there anything else that you're working on that you'd like to plug? Um, any other uh, uh, any other projects coming up? We're continuing to work on some uh, short film projects, and you know, trying to do some more longer form projects. You know, just trying to do everything I can on a uh, very small budget, very small resources, but just to keep making movies, uh, you know, any way that I can. And that's just uh, one thing I'll add. You know, about Sin Evangelist is you know it was shot with a, uh, you know, it wasn't anything fancy. It was the Android Stylo smartphone camera that, that I had at the time. And, uh, you know, I'll just, I'm mentioning that because I think the, the thing I'm always going on about is that, you know, don't let the uh, lack of equipment or the lack of a budget, you know, slow you down. If you have uh, movies, ideas that you want to get out there and make, just, you know, go ahead and do it any way you can. And uh, that, yeah. that's really, you know, that's, that's something I always kind of take with me in my own, my own uh, filmmaking efforts. Yeah, this, this equipment is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's we're ridiculous. living a great time, not just for watching, <laughs> but making films as yeah. well. So I always kind of like to give a shout out to that idea. All right. Well, Matt, thank you so much. Again, the uh, the project is Sin Evangelist. It's a 25 minute long, short interview based film with Mr. George Figgs uh, out of Baltimore. And uh, I, I encourage everybody to uh, check it out however you can. Um, and uh, and just soak it up and enjoy it. Matt, thanks. Thanks for talking to us.